Okay, we're going to continue on now with uh, some information about hematopoiesis. And as I mentioned on the last video clip, that word literally refers to blood cell formation. And that is a word you guys should know. Sometimes you'll also see hemopoiesis, so H-E-M-O instead of the A-T-O after the M. <clears throat> Those are both referring to the same thing. All right, so you guys actually should have learned in Biology 201 that blood cell formation actually takes place in the red bone marrow. And if you guys remember, you have red bone marrow and you have yellow bone marrow. And when you're first born, you have um, a lot more red bone marrow than you do once you become an adult. Um, you know, once you reach adulthood and as you continue to age, quite a bit of your red bone marrow winds up getting replaced with yellow, and the yellow bone marrow is essentially adipose tissue. The red bone marrow, though, consists of um, reticular connective tissue. You guys might, somewhere in the deep recesses of your brain, have some recollection of hearing that back in Biology 201. Uh, that's a type of connective tissue that contains a lot of reticular fibers which are kind of like thinner uh, collagen fibers and they're arranged more or less in a in a network or a mesh which helps hold the, those tissues together so red bone marrow consists of that type of tissue and then it contains blood sinusoids which that might be a new word for you that's kind of like a widened irregularly shaped uh, blood vessel or capillary so they tend, they can be a, a bit wider. And so basically what happens is you, your new blood cells get formed in this red bone marrow and then they enter these compartments called sinusoids and then those lead to blood vessels. Okay, so like they're showing you up here in this diagram of the bone, you have a large artery, you have a large vein there running through the center of that bone through the red bone marrow and down in here you've got these blood vessels and some of those are sinusoids they pick up the newly formed blood cells and send them up here to that big blue vein and now they're in the circulation they're gonna uh, move from there around to the different parts of the body all right where do you have red bone marrow once you're an adult um, it's mainly going to be found in the axial part of the skeleton so not so much in your appendages anymore. The girdles, you would find it in the girdles. You guys remember your uh, pectoral girdle and your pelvic girdle. So uh, your pectoral girdle, if you remember clavicles and scapulae. Pelvic girdle, of course, is your, uh, your two pelvic bones, your ozocoxy. Um, but then you do have it in the proximal epiphyses, the widened parts of the humerus and the femur as well. Those are the main places where you would find it once you're an adult. You might have heard before like somebody um, needing to have a bone marrow aspiration taken, like maybe they're concerned that somebody has a, a type of blood cell cancer and they have to look in the bone marrow for that because that's where those cancer cells are often located. And so they'll stick a needle in the hip to take some bone marrow out or some other part of the body as well. It's supposed to be extremely painful. All right, so how does hematopoiesis occur? All right, so believe it or not, in your red bone marrow, all of these different types of blood cells or formed elements we've been talking about, the red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets, they all um, are derived from the same type of stem cell. So if you have not heard that term before. A stem cell is basically a, um, a non-specialized cell that as it divides over and over and over again, um, it can become uh, different types of cells. So our bodies contain various kinds of stem cells. Some stem cells are more limited in, in terms of what they can turn into. For example, in your skin, uh, you have stem cells which when you get burned or injured, they're able to, as long as those stem cells don't die, they're able to recreate many of the structures in the skin. Those stem cells can't recreate um, other tissues within the body. They're not gonna become heart cells or muscle cells or neurons or things like that. They're more restricted. In your red bone marrow, you have these stem cells 
that have not specialized into anything yet, but they have the potential, the capability of turning into or becoming all of these different types of formed elements that we've been talking about. So those stem cells are called chemocytoblasts. And they're so good at turning into all of these various types of blood cells that we have. You know, if you do, if you ever get into the unfortunate situation where you do have like a severe form of leukemia and the only way to cure you is to kill all of your bone marrow because those cancer cells are coming from your bone marrow. Um, you know, typically what's done is you wipe out a patient's bone marrow and then you do a bone marrow transplant uh, with a donor who has been very carefully matched to your own bone marrow. And it doesn't take a lot. I mean, because as long as you get, you know, some of these hemocytoblasts or hematopoietic stem cells into that person who's receiving the uh, bone marrow transplant, those cells are going to divide and they're going to be able to recreate all of the different formed elements of the blood that that patient requires. So again, those are called hemocytoblasts, so keep that cell name in mind. And then how do these hemocytoblasts know what to turn into? Well, it's based on um, hormones. There are signals that are sent to uh, the bone marrow, you know, for example, we're going to talk about a hormone called EPO shortly, and EPO um, causes more red blood cells to develop from the uh, red bone marrow. Then there are various growth factors. Growth factors, these are other chemical signals. And many of these are um, very much like the hormones of your immune system. Uh, because what they do is they signal different types of white blood cells to develop. And then there are some that signal platelets to develop. And um, depending on what your body's needs are, you know, hey, we need more of this type of white blood cell. We need, no, we need more neutrophils right now or we need more platelets. There are different signals that are sent to the red bone marrow to cause more of the cells to develop along those pathways. All right, so now once blood cells start heading down some sort of pathway, they become committed at some point. So they go through multiple changes. It's not like a hemocytoblast, poof, it becomes a red blood cell, or poof, it becomes a neutrophil, or poof, it becomes a lymphocyte. It takes multiple steps to get them there. But at some point along those pathways, they become committed cells that cannot change pathways. They're going to become a neutrophil or they're going to become a lymphocyte. From that point, they can't change into, say, a platelet or a red blood cell. Then, as I said, once these uh, blood cells are formed, they enter those blood sinusoids, which are kind of, again, those are like unusually shaped blood vessels in your red bone marrow. And then from there, they flow into your blood vessels. They enter your general blood circulation. All right, this diagram is showing you that hematopoiesis is a pretty complex process. And if you're having a momentary heart attack looking at this diagram, no, you don't have to learn everything that you see here on this diagram. But I do want you to be aware of the complexity of what's going on here. And um, you should be familiar with some of the terminology. I'll point out some things to you on this diagram. I also want to point out to you this diagram is a little bit different from the one in your textbook. I thought this one was a little bit better which is why I um, stuck it in here. But if you're comparing this one to the one in your text, some of the names of the cells along these pathways will be a little bit different. Alright, so let's just take a look at this diagram. So over here on the left you see this terminology uh, pluripotent stem cell and um, that's another term here for um, the hemocytoblasts. So your hemocytoblasts, sorry my writing with this stylus looks like I'm a kindergartner. Um, these hemocytoblasts again are these unspecialized cells in the bone marrow and based on the chemical signals they receive, hormones, growth factors, and so forth, they will divide and they're down these various pathways that you see here. All right, so these hemocytoblasts can become either what are called myeloid stem cells or lymphoid stem cells. So as they divide, 
they'll start becoming partially committed to a particular pathway. And the two options are myeloid stem cell or lymphoid stem cell. All right, I'm going to erase all of that so I don't wind up with a big mess here on the slide. Now, once a, you have a myeloid stem cell, yes, that cell can divide over and over again, of course, but its offspring from that point are now only capable of becoming the various cell types that you see above that red line on the diagram. On the other hand, if you have a lymphoid stem cell down in here, partially specialized, not fully committed yet though, um, as it divides over and over again, its offspring can head down either this pathway or this pathway. So I do want you guys to be familiar with myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells and ultimately what those stem cells can turn into as they divide over and over again. And what I mean by that is down in here, this part of the diagram, these are your mature, fully specialized cells over here on the right hand side. The ones that you see um, in your lymphoid tissues, those are tissues of the lymphatic system that we'll study in unit three, and then the ones that are in your blood and in your tissues over here on that part of the diagram. So the fully specialized cells include things like the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils, your monocytes, all these different things that we talked about before. B cells and T cells, those are lymphocytes down there at the bottom part of the screen. There's your platelets, for example. So I do want you to be aware of which of those mature cell types come from myeloid stem cells and which ones come from lymphoid stem cells. It's actually pretty easy to remember because only your lymphocytes come from the lymphoid stem cells. So, and your lymphocytes include your B cells or B lymphocytes and your T cells or your T lymphocytes. Maybe you've heard of some of those before. Everything else comes from the myeloid stem cells. So that includes some pretty diverse things. That includes your red blood cells that you see over here, your platelets, and then those granulocytes that we talked about um, in the previous lecture, and also your monocytes come from the myeloid stem cells as well. All right, let me erase all of that. Now what about all this other stuff that you see over here? Like for example, along this pathway here. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at that. Um, along that pathway what you're seeing is that it takes multiple steps to go from a myeloid stem cell here to one of these fully specialized cell types over here. So you'll have myeloid stem cells that start dividing. Um, chemical signals have arrived in the red bone marrow which are causing um, the specialization processes to head down this pathway. And so these cells will go through changes. They'll become myeloblasts and promyelocytes and then myelocytes. They just gradually change along that path. And then finally, at the very end, they convert either into neutrophils or eosinophils or basophils. And that's, again, that's going to be dependent upon the chemical signals that are arriving in the red bone marrow. Um, this one's kind of interesting over here. If you guys remember, I said your platelets are actually cell fragments. And um, so when you need more platelets, what's going on is that myeloid stem cells become megakaryoblasts. Whenever you see that term blast as a suffix, blast generally refers to um, an immature cell type, a cell type that has not taken on a mature function. So hence like hemocytoblasts, these guys over here, those uh, completely unspecialized stem cells. Megakaryoblast. Mega means big. Um, karyo actually refers to nucleus. So they have a big nucleus. And then blast is an unspecialized cell type. And then those convert into, they undergo more changes and become megakaryocytes. So they have a big old nucleus there in the center. And then site means cell. So this is a uh, fully formed megakaryocyte. And those cells actually break apart 
and become platelets that enter the bloodstream. Platelets are essentially little cell fragments that are full of um, various chemical substances on the inside that play a role in blood clotting, which we'll be talking about not too far down the road. All right, so that was just kind of an overview. Keep the, um, the hematopoiesis processes in mind, uh, the complexity, and then do learn the, the things that I pointed out to you there and just kind of in general understand how hematopoiesis works. And we'll see some of that again a little bit later in the unit when we talk about white blood cell cancers, different types of leukemias. All right, in the next video lecture, we're actually going to talk about erythropoiesis, which guess what that means? Erythro refers to your red blood cells. So this is going to more specifically be the formation of the red blood cells. So we'll take a closer look at that in the fifth lecture and what controls that particular process. Thank you.